we have with us Matthew Miller from Fedora Community. Hello. Uh, Matthew, we have been talking with each other forever, I think. It's been a little while. I've been Fedora project leader for a few years now. So. The, the, the thing is, Fedora is close to my heart because uh, uh, Fedora is also a distribution. When I started my Linux journey in 2005, Fedora was the Fedora core, was the first Linux distribution that I was using. So what's, what's new going on in Fedora? Um, one of the things when I started as project leader, I had this idea of the Fedora rings and a kind of a more flexible way of putting Fedora together and kind of trying different things towards that. And one of the ideas that's kind of come out of that is Fedora modularity. And so this is the first release that has uh, modularity available. Uh, and um, it's not very grandiose, but I think it's kind of the beginning of things. Um, it lets you have something like um, a different versions of Node.js are easily available depending on what you're doing. Um, and so this is one of the things we get in Fedora a lot is Fedora moves so fast I can't ever use it to actually deploy my stuff on because uh, you know, 13 months later I've got to upgrade to a new release because it's end of life. So you know, where's my Fedora LTS? And uh, doing an LTS release is very expensive and hard and I don't think we have um, Fedora takes a lot of work to put together as it is. We've got thousands of people who work on it every year and asking all those volunteers, yeah, we'd like you to keep doing that in a long-term maintenance sort of thing for you know five years or whatever. That's kind of thankless work. Um, so we wanted to find a way to give people that kind of thing they need for their applications to keep applications running over a longer time without necessarily exploding the amount of volunteer work needed to maintain that and kind of give people, instead of when people are asking for an LTS, like give them what they really need, which is uh, uh, stable you know, stacks for their, for their actual applications rather than necessarily really needing a long-term support kind of thing. Um, of course, if you do need long-term support, there's things like RHEL, which are very good for that actual paid support. Um, but if you just want to have something that runs you know, longer and you're kind of following the leading edge of things, but you also want to um, have something more than a six-month life cycle, um, modularity can give you that kind of thing. And then we're hoping that, you know, as RHEL follows what Fedora does, that the um, same modular approach can give on RHEL, where you have a long lifecycle base, but you might need newer, more up-to-date stacks, that same technology can apply to that. So that's exciting to me, I don't know. So. No, that, if I do want long-term support, why won't I go to CentOS, you know, because the same, you know. Yeah, so, uh, I, it's the same thing with RHEL. Uh, if you want something that is moving, that that is basically, you know, it comes out and then it stays the same way for uh -huh. 10 years, um, that's a value that, you know, RHEL gives you or CentOS gives you. But you then, um, what if you want to have your thing based on a newer version right. of Python or Ruby or something like right. that? So they kind of have the so opposite problem. So you can have problem. best of both worlds, right? You, you, you're moving yeah. fast at the same time you can have, you know, with Fedora, you can move fast. At the same time, you, you don't have right. to worry about everything breaking after the 12, 12 or 13 months. Right. right. And so and I hope that um, as we move forward, we can kind of have a um, you pick the best of both worlds sort of thing, where if you need some parts from the Fedora world that are moving fast, like we can provide that to you. If you need things that are slower you know, from the CentOS world, those can be there. And of course, uh, if you need you know, the value add that RHEL provides, like that's, that's always. The... When we look at Fedora, who is your target audience? Fedora is a big project, and we have a lot of different target audiences for a lot of our different deliverables. Kind of our core, our core audience for Fedora and the mission statement itself is actually um, the developers and people who are building solutions for other people. Right. So our kind of our core audience is somebody who wants to take all of the packages and software we have in Fedora and make a solution for users. So uh, one of the things I think is very cool last couple of releases is Fedora Python Classroom Lab, which is basically a Fedora um, flavor that's meant for someone who's teaching Python in their classroom. So they are, uh, you know, you really want to have a Vagrant box or a virtual machine or um, a Docker image that has uh, like Python learning tools ready for you there. So um, as a core project, kind of the Fedora mission is we want to make it easy for people to build those things uh, and then um, give those to users. And then in a wider, like bigger umbrella sense, then um, the target users of all of those things are also our target audience. So we want, right. um, and so 
then as part of that, um, we kind of have these main showcase editions. So we have Thor Workstation, which right. is a desktop environment based on GNOME and um, meant to be like a developer workstation or developer, you know, obviously. Um, some of the people on the team kind of don't like the workstation name. They feel like it means like a big clunky desktop, but um, kind of what we picked that name to kind of imply a little more technical user um, than um, why don't you say Vero Desktop? Yeah, well, we, we, we might we might eventually move to that. that. But um, we kind of wanted to signal that we weren't necessarily trying to do take over the world with the desktop, but kind of focus on your, your you know, um, the people we're going to conferences. We see people, you know, at a Linux conference on their Mac. Um, we wanted to uh, be, have a desktop that appeals to those people. Right. It's kind of the thing. Um, and then, so uh, that's the audience for Fedora Workstation. For Fedora Server, um, Kind of see that as a, uh, in some ways, a uh, preview for RHEL kind of thing. So that's kind of a direct connection mm -hmm. kind of thing there. Uh, so people who are looking at what's coming in the next RHEL or wanting to influence what's coming in the next RHEL, Fedora Server like is a place to both uh, look at what's there and to participate in it to see like, okay, I can help sort of shape the direction. And of course blah, blah, blah business stuff. There's no promises that what goes into Fedora Server ends up in RHEL. Um, but it's definitely a way to participate. And then uh, our third edition is Fedora uh, Atomic Host, which is container-focused um, Kubernetes workload uh, platform. And um, that's getting a big news at the summit today, of course, with the CoreOS acquisition and the plans for that in the future. So we'll see where that goes in the next you know, months and years. Um, There's one more that. Fedora I know about it, you okay. may not. Fedora okay. IoT. Fedora IoT, right. So yeah. uh, I do know about it. That's an upcoming, <laughs> upcoming thing. So we're looking at making a Fedora IoT platform as another one of the top level editions. And so that's not, um, it's not official yet, but we're hoping a Fedora 29 or Fedora 30. And um, I'm pretty excited about that as well because I think that's a good way for people to get into computers. Um, like so, when I was a kid, like I would go and play with Apple II computers and like you know before school, and um, you would look at an Apple II and you came up to a basic prompt and you could type in like you you know print your name go to right. ten kind of thing, and you could make it do things. And you'd like get a game like Oregon Trail or something like that, and you would see that like um, this is something that as a kid like I could make that game like you could learn you do a graphics tutorial and it's not that complicated, but if you look today and you go and you like buy a, a game like it's a billion dollar production that you are never as one person going to be able to make anything like. So um, I think uh, IoT is great because it's something that just as an individual person, you can look, you, can, you know, get a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone or one of these boards, get some Arduino stuff, and like you can actually make stuff that like makes your house go. You can make a robot, and you can do all these kind of cool things that are on the scale of one person. So I think that's important for open source and for the um, future of computing, really. Um, so I'm pretty excited to have Fedora be a part of that. What kind of relationship is there between uh, Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL? Um, we're working that out still. Um, I think that the Fedora and RHEL relationship has always been pretty clear where Fedora serves as the upstream. And then um, traditionally, every couple years, RHEL breaks off and makes a new release from Fedora. Um, I think as we're going forward, um, RHEL, and let's talk about the modularity stuff, uh, I think it's important for RHEL to move more faster, more faster, to move more quickly, there's my words, and be more responsive to customer needs for newer, faster software. Um, and so I hope that we can have sort of a, a closer tie between Fedora and RHEL um, so that it's not that like four-year lag fork kind of thing. Um, of course, you know, Fedora is a community project with a lot of um, you know, many, many core contributors to Fedora don't work for Red Hat, so RHEL's not our only concern, but it is a very important stakeholder that we keep in mind. Um, and um, so uh, CentOS, you know, recently, it's not even recent anymore, but uh, became part of the Red Hat family and um, serves as a downstream to RHEL, uh, but they're also kind of working on those things, CentOS SIGs, where they have like new kind of experimental yeah, things the upstream for that. RHEL, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in some ways it serves as an upstream kind of thing, and that's, um, 
always been a little bit confusing, like how does that work with Fedora also being the upstream? Um, so we are starting to work a little more closely with the CentOS people and kind of collaborate back and forth. Um, one of the really key things in Fedora is Fedora Apple, which is uh, Fedora packages built on an enterprise Linux base. And that's actually, like if you see the graphs for Fedora growth, they're like this. And if you look at the graphs for Apple, they're like this. I thought so Fedora Apple is for Macintosh. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Apple, or, or some people say Apple, yeah. E P E L. It's, it's uh, um, extension pack, something like that. Extra packages extra for packages, Enterprise yes, Linux, yeah. yeah. And so that is an incredibly popular mm -hmm. thing that even you know a large number of Red Hat customers use it, CentOS people use it. And so that's kind of a bridge between Fedora and CentOS. And I think that's an area where we can see more collaboration. So I would like to work more closely with CentOS in the future, and I think we'll see more collaboration there because we're all really in the same family. Right, uh, right, right. As, as the landscape is changing and uh, most of us are kind of moving to IoT devices and mobile devices, uh, people say the stop is kind of dying off, and which is true to some extent because most uh, you know average user they don't need desktop. In the early days, when you, uh, it doesn't really matter what you want to do, your only option was a desktop. So everybody bought a desktop no matter what. Now, like my wife, you know, other, in, in her office she uses a desktop at home. She's fine with her phone. Uh, but at the same time, uh, while you are targeting these problems, somebody has to build application and content for these uh, platforms. So that's where you actually need even more powerful, when you're dealing it's, with VR and all those things it, even more. So desktop will become a specialized platform, it, which may also create an opportunity for Linux, because now instead of targeting everybody, you have very specialized group. So what, what, what are your thoughts about that? You've actually already said my answer for me. It's exactly <laughs> what I've been saying for years, I think. Um, People, when most people don't really want a computer, like I, I, I'm a computer geek. I think you're probably a little bit of a computer geek yourself, right? Yes. Um, so, um, and I've always wanted a computer. Like that's a thing for its own sake. It's cool to me. Um, but to most people, it's they want the applications, they want the communication capability, and basically having a computer is a horrible, painful price you pay in order to get the things you want. And so, you know, as like. Um, as the other ways to get those same things, you know, more um, device kind of stuff, which comes it in a packaged, consumer-oriented way, as those things become easily more accessible, um, the market for having real general-purpose computers is on the decline. But I think we still, like content creators and programmers and just computer geeks, we're going to want to have computers for a long time. Um, it may be that the golden age of you know sub one thousand dollar computers is is now, and that things like when it stops being a mass market thing, like um, it it may be that you know when you go to buy a computer, it's like a niche product that you get from, uh, and so I, I don't know um, if if the mass market moves away from us, what what will happen there? But I think there always will be um, you know laptops and desktop computers, and I think that. Um, uh, it eventually will be the year of Linux on the desktop on those things because as those consumer um, the consumer market moves away, uh, it will not be so interesting to you know big corporations. It's not really a thing that's uh, compelling to them, and I think so. We'll see more and more you know Linux and more and more DIY stuff on on that thing. And I think that um, Linux is going to have a much higher percentage. I won't say that it's going to be the uh, 100% Linux in the next five years or something like that, but I think that Linux will be a much higher percentage of that developer uh, and um, hacker and whatever, the people who really want a computer, um, Linux is a natural fit there. Um, I think you already see that if you look at the Stack Exchange developer survey. I don't know if you followed that. Um, I, I do. A big I Stack yeah. Exchange fan. I think they're mm -hmm. awesome. And you know they've shown like you know something like twenty percent share for Linux and kind of growing over the last few years. And I think that kind of um, it, it, the thing you said and the thing I said like it's not just a. Um, a, a Article of faith. I think we can see that it's actually happening. It's happening. Well, I mean, so. if you if you really uh, if you're monitoring industry, you know where we are going. And there are a couple of things. You know, one you mentioned that you know at the funny thing is if, even when I go at open source events, you know, I see uh, Mac OS. There are two couple of reasons. Where, but I, it, it has nothing to do with that. First of all, I've talked to actually a lot of companies that why do you, they use uh, Macs, and their answer are simple. They are like our IT departments. Uh, it's very easy to deal with just vendor because Apple has a very clear policy of return and you know repair. 
when yeah. you when you use Windows system, you know you are dealing with Lenovo's and HP's, and now it's too complicated. So it's simplified. Second is most of, of our workload is you know some open source application, and Mac has Unix. You know, so you fire up the terminal and you can get everything done. So you get best of both worlds. And then once you install Homebrew, you have access to everything that is Linux. So so that is one of the reasons you know they use. Uh, but uh, to going back to the point, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to. I mean, it's your time to speak. But mm -hmm. the way I see it is that as uh, the the consumer market declines and the specialized market grows up, even when company like Adobe see that you know they can, when they really need to optimize uh, their, their 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 experience using whatever you know, whether it's hardware or GPUs, it will be very easy to work with Linux than to work with Microsoft or you know Apple. You know, yeah. so if you look at the graphics, you know, graphical workloads, it might be much more easier to to just go raw with the at the OS level instead of trying to convince Apple, which doesn't even offer you know sometimes uh, codecs for the latest cameras. So. Yeah. So like for example, I just bought two new cameras, you know, Lumix GH5s, yeah. and, and I don't have those codecs on Apple. Adobe has them, but I cannot see those images on my Apple natively. So, yeah, I know, as the market um, changes, maybe it will lean towards Linux. I, I hope so. It'll be interesting to see. I know the camera companies tend to be fairly conservative in their software, so we'll, they may we'll see be. But happens, the people who but... run the workloads, you know, they, I mean, when I buy a five thousand dollar camera and I, I build a seven thousand dollar computer, I want full optimization of my software also. Yeah. So, so companies may move so. in that. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, so when you when you like uh, look at anyway while we are still talking about emerging technology and changing <laughs> market, uh, machine learning kind of things are becoming really really important. Uh, so as a platform, where you said you know people who are building for someone else, how equipped is Fedora to enable people to use machine learning frameworks and stuff like that? Uh, I think um, we're in pretty good shape. We have some people who are kind of looking into the next next generation of things, but. Um, a lot of the uh, machine learning stuff is in Python, TensorFlow, and those kind of things. And Fedora is fairly friendly for those kind of languages. Um, I think one of the things that is a challenge is um, the CUDA drivers and kind of NVIDIA's dominance in the field. So uh, NVIDIA uh, proprietary drivers and proprietary CUDA stack are pretty key towards a lot of machine learning today. Um, it would be awesome if NVIDIA would eventually see the light and open source that stuff. Um, I'm not going to hold my breath until it happens. Um, so um, some of the stuff we've done in Fedora Workstation to make it at least easier to install the NVIDIA drivers um, makes it a better, like that is also important and useful for the uh, machine learning space where those same drivers are necessary even not for desktop applications. Um, so I think we're in pretty good shape around there, and I think the um, the stuff that the Red Hat uh, team working on machine learning stuff is going to be coming into Fedora as well, and I think there's um, interesting things there. And I think there are interesting things in machine learning um, for how we put together the operating system as well, because um, there is just so much software out there that is open source. Like in uh, when we started doing Fedora, you know, 15, you know, basically two decades ago, right? Um, open source was kind of an uncertain thing, and there was a lot of it out there, and it was kind of a mess. And so we put together Linux distributions to bring order to this chaos of the universe of open source software, and did a pretty good job about that. But um, it was a human project where we took all the software and formed it into well-formed RPMs or you know, DEBs if you're over in the other universe. Um, and made you know, basically made life better in that way. Uh, but now, open source has basically won. It's the default. And if you look at the number of you know, open source projects on GitHub or even beyond GitHub, like it's just not a human scale problem anymore. So we're going to need to look at machine learning in the future for figuring out how to like how to put software together and how to provide what we provide in Fedora by hand. How can we provide the same value to people in a you know, robot powered universe? Uh, while we are like talking about all these things, we are also, as, I mean, though actually NVIDIA is at Red Hat Summit, so have you talked to them? Uh, I have not. Some I other, talked to other... them yesterday, okay. yeah, yeah, but uh, uh, while we're talking about, you know, all these players, one of the barriers that I see with uh, desktop Linux is that uh, Debian Word, as you said, Debian Universe, and it's really hard. I don't know what the life of a developer, but as a user, it really becomes really hard 
to kind of have the same kind of experience ac across distribution even if you're using the same distribution you're in different different desktop environments the so um, I've been I've been talking to a lot of people and I've been thinking why why, why can't the the desktop Linux community have some kind of I mean there is free desktop or but, yeah. but some kind of realistic you know where you, what, what you do as we have seen in the Kubernetes world or in the OpenStack world that okay all the you know when you talk a networking stack or sound it's all standardized you know it doesn't really matter which distribution you use everything is totally same and standardized and then you just leave one interface layer on top of that application layer is also totally you know uh, kind of standardized it doesn't really matter so uh, that what will happen it, it will lower the barrier for even companies like nvidia or whatever to support linux as a, as a as a single platform instead of five different distributions have you ever thought about that or or if you uh, okay let's yeah. let, just just add to the our earlier discussion where we are thinking about as you know the market changes and desktop kind of become a niche linux might have an opportunity there but because of this fragmentation we may once again lose so what do you say? About yeah, that? I, on, on the desktop and like the different um, the different desktop environments, I think a lot of it is um, it's so personal. Like it's very opinionated, and you have your desktop right. environment. It's like um, you know your layout of your house in some ways. So um, it's kind of hard to say like everybody should have you know a standardized like if everybody's apartment had the bathroom in the same place and the bedroom here and the kitchen here. Um, it would be easier for everybody. Not in the um, same so, place, but using the same plumbing, so that you know when you yeah, when you get some a guy to replace your tap, everybody oh, knows. Right. This. And you know that's a pain because the, actually they come out and they're charging you and they're like, oh, we've got this kind of tap, and then they, right. yeah, very expensive. So it's a good analogy. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I think in a lot of ways things have tended that way, where we have you know system D, where a lot of people were very skeptical about it, but so that you know. It used to be that the only common layer really was the kernel, and now the system D folks have kind of moved that up so that um, we basically have system D as a common infrastructure layer across many distributions, if not everything. So I think that that kind of helps there. Um, I would like to see the free desktop stuff revived a little bit more to show um, a little more collaboration in, in um, common plumbing kind of things, but I think there are those efforts in doing that, and um, at Fedora, we do like to work together with other distributions wherever we can to share those kind of things. Right, right. Sometimes I feel that uh, the desktop Linux community uh, sometimes lacks three C's. I call them three C's: uh, collaboration with each other, communication with each other, and compromises. You know, if, if this just increases, all those problems will be kind of solved, and we'll have a big giant Linux. Uh, just one platform. You will still have the just the way with OpenStack or Kubernetes. You know, you still have you can you can have your own distribution. You can customize it. You can sell it, but you don't have to worry about a lot of nuts and bolts there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. Collaboration is hard. So in uh, open source work, in open source, right? It is, and it takes a lot of work. And so that's um, and so sometimes it's easier to just say I'm going to make this thing and see how this goes here. And then I think some of it is um, there's a lot of ideas that. Like there's no clear winner mm -hmm. yet, and I think that when, where there are areas that you know win, winners emerge, um, I think we um, do have some collaboration right. there. I mean, you could see uh, Canonical deciding that it wasn't so great to go their own on the desktop, and so they're um, standardizing on GNOME there as well. Um, uh, I, I think it will tend tend towards that, but. I think things just aren't settled yet. Right. So, right. and again, a lot and on the collaboration is hard. Um, when you have you know, just a few people working on a project that they care about a lot, you know, um, they can put their time into the thing they care about, or they can put their time into collaboration. And so they put their time into what they care about, and other people find it useful, and it kind of grows from there. And it's not that they don't care about collaboration; right. it's just a matter of focus and things. And so. I think it'll all come out. Yeah, it's easier to afford them to take pains and talk and collaborate and yeah, compromise. Which, um, yeah, which I like to do a lot. And I think it's an important part of what we do as a distribution and not just um, a collection of software as well. So I, I think I think we covered some topics given the time we had today, and I mean I know we yeah. talked so much either way. <laughs> yeah, now my my throat's kind of settled it's down fine. too. I, but so, uh, anyway, thank you yeah. so much. Time. Should we start again because your throat is settled yeah, now? Yeah, we could. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to meet an 11 year old developer now. Okay. So it will be um, exciting that's to see awesome. what she has to say. Yeah, I'm curious. See if you can get her to run Fedora. Hopefully she does. I think her dad works for Microsoft. I actually bumped into him at okay. the booth. Oh, he's like, oh, 
will be talking to you. I say, oh, okay. So d does she run my Windows or Linux? She says she does, but she finds, she said that it's easier to compile on Linux, so she uses Linux. So nice. I'm like, okay, that's nice. Get that, get that quote in the interview. Yes,